Hello. <laughs> Uh, welcome to the, uh, the second session uh, of Nessus. Uh, my name is Andrew Swift. I'll be chairing the session for, for this morning. Uh, we have three great speakers for you. And so without uh, taking up any more time, let me introduce the first one. The first speaker is Dr. Sam Robertson. He's a senior research fellow at Victoria University, which, who also holds a joint appointment as the senior sports scientist at the Western Bulldogs AFL Club. He has authored over 35 peer-reviewed articles, predominantly in the area of skill acquisition and sports analytics, and currently supervises 12 research students in these areas. He has previously worked as a sports scientist in national sporting institutes in Australia, the United Kingdom, and Asia, and has managed the research and innovation for the Golf Australia High Performance Program since 2011. So please welcome Dr. Sam Robertson. Uh, thanks very much for the, the invitation, Andrew, uh, and the, the introduction more accurately. Okay, uh, thanks very much for having me uh, today. Hopefully you can cope with, with my accent throughout. I am from the south of Australia and I have been told we're a little bit more easy to understand than our northern counterparts. But again, if you need clarification at any stage throughout, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I'm going to talk about a method that we've been working on for, uh, I guess, uh, 18 months or so, and this is part of my role, uh, which Andrew mentioned uh, earlier in his introduction. Um, and I'll, I've used in the title that we're talking about this method being used in team sports, but the example I'll give you today will actually be in Australian rules football specifically, um, because that's the sport I'm spending most time uh, in at, uh, at present. So this work, I should acknowledge, uh, was done in collaboration with uh, uh, a co-worker of mine at Curtin University, uh, Dr. Ritu Gupta, and then an honours student. This is actually an honours project um, I'm presenting today from uh, one of my students this year, Sam McIntosh. So I'll start off with a quote uh, uh, that you've probably all seen and used at different stages uh, to illustrate different points in different presentations. Certainly not relevant specifically to sport. Uh, and I can't take credit for using this in a sporting context either. The, the late, great Tom Riley, uh, who really was the first sports scientist at Liverpool John Moores University um, way back uh, many years ago now, uh, first used this about 25 years ago in an article and he was using this point to de bemoan the fact that in analysis in sport we really focus a lot on the first of, uh, of Kipling's six on a serving men and that is the what. It's very easy for us to focus on what happens in a match, the descriptive characteristics and we can use this in a post hoc fashion after a match to illustrate what happened. It's a lot more difficult to focus on these other five. And, and obviously, recently, with this advent of wearable technologies and computer vision, we've been able to get more insights into the where and the when. So, in specific terms, the spatio-temporal components of, of what we see in, in team sports. But specifically today, I want to focus on the who, and not so much around the who of what player should we select or what player is important to winning uh, a particular match, but actually, across the distribution of performers on a given team. And Australian Rules Football provides a really good platform for this because we have uh, 22 players on each team at any given one time, which is probably uh, one of the higher numbers of uh, participations, uh, participants on the field at any one time in, in, in world sport. And so some of the origins for this work I'm going to talk about today have, have been from conversations with colleagues and conversations within the Western Bulldogs Club as well uh, that are, are really pertinent to coaches at this point in time. Almost all the work that I try and do whilst, even if it has a methodological nature to it, is always around uh, focusing on, on what wins a particular match. So some of the questions that we've been uh, asking are around, uh, can we build a roster or a, a team squad that has a, a, a spread of contributors or is it more advantageous for us to have a, a superstar? Now this is a particularly pertinent question in Australian sport and many other sports as well, not so much in this country, but Specifically, we have salary caps, so we can't just keep spending. And yes, some clubs have more money than others, and they manage to pull those resources into areas of their football departments which can give them a competitive advantage. But certainly with regards to player spending, we, we can't. And so it's really important, more than in, in sports that don't have caps, that we actually make the right decisions with our contracting uh, and our selection and development of players that are already within our roster. And so these are the types of questions that we're, we're starting to uh, be asked by coaches and which is why we put some resources uh, into it. 
Given I'm using Australian rules football as an example today, I thought I'd give you just a two minute overview of what actually happens in the sport. And that's mainly because I'm guessing that most people in the room aren't that familiar with the game. So let's just uh, bear with me for a couple it of minutes. Explains the rules of Australian rules football. Australian rules football, more commonly known as Aussie rules football, is a game played with two teams of 22, with 18 players from each team taking to the field at any one time. The game is played on an oval field that's generally a maximum of 185 metres by 155 metres. This is by far one of the largest fields of any team sports, and players have to be extremely fit in order to cover this much ground. These are the goal squares, the centre square and centre circle, and there are two 50 metre lines arched around the goalposts at each end of the field. Pay attention now, as these lines are important. The game starts with a ball up in the centre square. The object of the game is for your team to score more overall points than the opposing team. To score, a player must try and kick the ball through the middle two posts. If you successfully kick the ball through the middle two posts, this is a goal and is worth six points. If you hit one of the goal posts, if the ball is deflected by another player through the goal posts, or if you kick it between a long goal post and a short behind post, this is known as a behind and this only scores one point. The game is played in four 20 minute quarters for a combined playing time of 80 minutes. So the team with the highest amount of points from goals and behinds at the end of time wins. Kicking the ball through a couple of goal posts for 80 minutes, that sounds dead easy. Well, not so much. Standing in your way are 18 members of the opposing team who are trying to take the ball away from you so that they can score themselves. They are allowed to block kicks, intercept the ball, push you off the field, or tackle you by grabbing you below the shoulders and pulling you to the floor. If they do tackle you, they are awarded a free kick from the spot of the tackle. To move the ball off the field, you have to be quick and you have to dispose of the ball before an opponent tackles you. You can move the ball by kicking it in any direction, running with it so long as you bounce it on the floor at 15 metres, or handballing the ball where you strike the ball with clenched fist to a teammate. Throwing the ball is absolutely not allowed in Australian rules football, and your opponent will be awarded a free kick if you do. Now, that doesn't sound so easy anymore. Is there any other way of moving the ball up the field? Yes, there is. The saving grace for your team is called the mark. If you kick the ball in the air 15 metres or more, and a teammate catches it without the ball bouncing on the ground, this is known as a mark or marking the ball. The player is then awarded a free kick from that spot and cannot be touched by an opponent for 10 seconds. So that just gives you a bit of an insight into some of the characteristics of a sport which is probably foreign uh, to most of us in the room. I'll leave these up for 15 seconds or so and see how quickly you can read through them. But these are some of the performance indicators of Australian rules football. And you heard some of these terms used, I suppose, throughout uh, the short excerpt of, of, of video there. But in particular, uh, goals is the, the fourth one down, which is the fifth one down, sorry, which is very important in just about any team sport. So we'll keep moving on. So I said earlier that most of the research that we undertake, in fact, hopefully all of the research we undertake in our research group relates to what wins. And uh, a colleague of mine at the Australian Institute of Sport uses this, uh, these two words together just about at the start of every presentation, so I, uh, I must uh, give credit to Stuart Morgan uh, on that front. But it's a really good, uh, I guess, phrase to come back to when we're deciding whether we actually put some time and resources into undertaking a research question or not. So what's being done to date? Before I go into today's uh, main analysis. I'll give you a quick three or four minute update about some of the research that's being done on this in Australian rules football to date. And considering how much sports science and sports performance research is done in Australian rules football, there's actually not been that much. And, and this paper came out earlier this year in the Journal of Sports Science uh, with myself and, yet a, and another uh, PhD student of mine. And we were looking at how we could actually explain match outcome as a binary win-loss situation. And we use logistic regression, we also use a decision tree approach to actually do this. And you can see, it's, it may be a little bit difficult to see from the back, but basically two of those performance indicators we saw in the video being kicks and goal conversion, so how accurate we kick for goal, were the two most important things to have more of than the opposition. It's fairly intuitive for people that are aware of the game, but uh, the fact that it was we were able to actually do this with pretty, just using these two performance indicators, classify a winning or a losing outcome for a team with a fairly high accuracy. So around about 80 to 90% uh, to on our training set and then slightly overfit model uh, around about 79, 80% for our, uh, our testing set. And so uh, what this started to do was actually provide us more impetus 
for some of the work we wanted to carry on with this year. And so yet another honours student of mine for this year has actually started to look at the importance of team in these types of predictions. Does the team involved in a match and the opposition that they're playing actually influence uh, the importance of these particular performance indicators we looked at. And so uh, I won't go into the details of the analysis here, but we, we used a random forest approach. And you can see there on the importance of plot that um, fairly high up towards the top, both the team and opposition team were <coughs> certainly warranted looking at in, in some of our future um, analysis and future modelling. And from a win-loss accuracy perspective, again, we got some similar classification accuracy to, uh, to what we saw in the previous example as well. And all of this with uh, certainly a more granular model. So we had uh, the opportunity to actually look at team. Uh, we were able to look at a quarter-by-quarter -quarter basis as well. Um, and as a result of this, we actually used some in-game uh, predictions software that we developed for our coaches. Uh, not dissimilar to a, a paper I saw uh, from 2013 here at Nessus, uh, in NFL uh, using random forest as well. We also looked at a, a, some clustering of team, but I, I, time will probably um, forbid, uh, forbid me from actually going to that in great detail today. So if we look at a snapshot of where uh, analysis in Australian rules football, as in a lot of other team sports, was at the moment, we had these traditional performance analysis looking at these what type questions. The spatio-temporal data is allowing us to investigate these types of questions. But the who questions remain unresolved. So if we go back to our first aim that I mentioned uh, earlier on in uh, the start of my presentation, can we start to look at whether we want a spread of contributors in our team or whether we want just um, superstars uh, to put our time and resources into? So the main three aims of this project I I'll talk about today was we want to describe the distribution of player performances in team sports and provide a method in which to do that. I'm going to use Australian rules football as an example to look at whether we can use these distributions to actually uh, model and, and explain match outcome. And then, uh, hopefully, time permitting, towards the end, I'll give you a little bit of an example, a plot example of how we can use this with how we structure our rosters. So what did we do for this particular piece of work? Well, there's 197 games played in every uh, Australian Football League season, uh, not, not including the playoffs. Uh, and basically, we obtained data on all of those matches. Uh, we obtained player and team values for 13 different performance indicators. Now, we selected those performance indicators based on uh, previous research, which I've indicated on, on, the, on this slide, but also uh, just heuristically, basically things that have been used in the media as well and things that coaches wanted to look at within our, our particular club, the Western Bulldogs. What you can see is over the season this results in an, a quite a, a large number of observations, particularly for things like kicks and disposals, around 145,000 instances. But in order to compare from one match to the other, and also from season to season, we need to actually do something with this data. We obviously know that when we have a match with kicks, some teams will, every game that they play, will have a variable response with how many kicks they get, and as well as for every other performance indicator. So we needed to actually normalise that value as a percentage contribution. And so there's 22 players that compete in, a, in an AFL team, and so we need to actually change the way that that data was reported from an absolute to a relative format. And so here's an example of how we did that. It's very simple. But here's an example of uh, one match from the Western Bulldogs from 2014, uh, which we recorded 191 kicks. You can see that basically our top three contributors for kicks in that game all had 15 from the graph. Our lowest two had uh, only two kicks. And if we look at this as a distribution, as, 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 a percent, uh, sorry, as percentages of the total uh, of the team, those values are fairly easy to report as, say, one, just over 1% 1 contribution from our lowest player to about a 7.8% contribution from the top. So what other information did we get before we actually undertook this, this main analysis? Well, we, we know we've got 18 teams in the Australian Football League, each with 22 players in a given match. We extracted the win-loss as well as the margin, so negative being a loss and uh, positive being a, a win. We've got our 13 performance indicators of interest here. And then we wanted to describe that distribution across those 22 players. And so the way we did that was through obtaining some, some fairly um, normal indicators of this, the maximum, minimum, standard deviation, and the mean, but also uh, some, some percentiles as, as well. So there's 11 in total. Um, so if you do some quick maths in your head, you'll realize that there's 13 performance indicators. We're extracting 11 features of interest for each in a given match which means we have 143 uh, features of interest that we're extracting for each game for each team. 
Here's an example of, of how this might, might look. So if we come back to our graph for kicks from the previous slide, uh, we've got the same data represented here with percent contributions. To extract this information visually, it's, it's fairly simple. We can find the maximum and the minimum contribution of the team very comfortably. The mean, of course, will always be 4.54 because we've got a fixed 22 players uh, participating in each match. We can then extract things like the standard deviation, and I haven't um, labelled these, but just the distribution uh, of those percentiles as well. And so we do this for all 12 uh, additional performance indicators and then look at how this corresponds with match outcome. How do we do this? Well, we wanted to uh, obviously explain match outcome as win or loss as a function of those features set of all those performance indicators. So 143 features. We used a generalised estimating equations approach to do this. Uh, we used GEPAC in, in R for this. Uh, the rationale behind that was we wanted to obviously, very similar to Hannah's talk um, just before morning tea, adjust for that dependence of those 18 teams. Uh, we know that that's there. Again, the Rand Forest uh, analysis I showed you earlier actually shows that quite clearly as well. Uh, in order to look at the success of our models, we actually used uh, a classification accuracy. We, we took the median uh, accuracy uh, following a tenfold cross validation. The second part of our analysis was using a decision tree, which uh, we use a J48 decision tree, which is just a, a variant on the original uh, C4.5 um, decision tree proposed by Ross Quinlan back in the uh, early 90s. What did we find? Well, our early results from the GEE showed that only eight of those 143 features really were contributing meaningfully to our model. And three of these were doing so in a positive manner. So higher 50th and 25th percentile values across our team for disposals were uh, linked with a positive match outcome. And from a negative perspective, we can see that goals features quite heavily, which is good because that's an easier story to tell than talking about some of these perform other performance indicators. And if we look at the world's uh, chi-squared chi values for each of those, you can see that the 70th percent, 75th, 95th and 90th percentile values for goals were in particular important to the model. How did the model actually perform? Well, not so well. We're only actually able to predict with around about an accuracy of about 64% for this particular uh, analysis. But if we consider that we're not looking at the magnitude of differences between teams' performance indicators, we're just looking at the differences in their distributions, we were actually quite buoyed by this, and by combining this with uh, some of the earlier models that I uh, showed in my introduction, we've actually been able to improve on that classification accuracy already. Uh, and again, uh, time will, uh, won't permit me to actually report those today. So let's dig a little bit deeper into goals, seeing that it was so important. If we look at here from left to right on our x-axis, the lowest contributor in a team to the highest contributor, so 1 through 22, we can actually visualise those uh, points on the graph. And if we do that with an area curve, it's probably a little bit easy just to visualise where those points start to split. And we see, particularly with the, 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 uh, the win, starts to flatten out that line around about that 75th percentile value, around about player 17. What does this mean practically? Well, essentially it means that we're starting to get a greater contribution for more with respect to goals scoring when we're winning matches. <coughs> So it isn't left up to as, many, as few players. We're getting more contributions from our midfield players that maybe don't always kick goals in Australian rules football. And so if we dig a little bit deeper into 75th percentile values for goals in particular, we can see that let's have a look at whether this is actually something that's holding true for all the 18 teams that are competing in the Australian Football League. And I've ordered these teams from uh, the team that was on top of the ladder that season, Sydney, all the way through to the team that was at the bottom, which was St Kilda. Uh, we won't keep an eye on the fact that the Bulldogs are way down here. Mind you, I started this year and we came six, so we can have a look at the, uh, the correlation between that. We can see that for 17 of those 18 teams, this, this rule of the 75th percentile being lower in winning teams is actually holding true throughout, except for just the one, Melbourne, towards the, uh, the end, who finished 17th on the ladder for that particular season. But if we look at this... You can see there's uh, some quite, it's, it's a linear model and we're looking at something that's not particularly linear and when we start to actually look at uh, margin instead of match outcome in a binary sense, we start to find some interesting things and if we look at margin on the x-axis here from, uh, from zero points right in the middle here all the way up to 140 point <coughs> loss which um, is, is a very big loss in any, in any term, we see that it appears that there's actually something called, that we'd probably call an optimal zone with respect to how much contribution we want from that 70th percentile to our goal scoring. 
Our model indicated that we want lower values, but quite clearly we see that actually that's not always the case. We've got some really low values of zero here for losing teams, but we've also got some really high ones. And so this is a bit of a precursor to my, uh, the results of the decision tree, which I'll show you in a, in a moment, but it appears that values around 5 to 7.5% look like they actually may be more optimal for winning. And so if we actually show the results of that decision tree, this is actually what we actually get confirmed. And if we look at this result here in particular, we actually see that, and I need to get a bit closer to it myself, those values of 75th percentile between 5 and 7.5, so basically what I showed here in this shaded green, uh, grey area, when teams recorded values between 5 and 7.5, and they won on 95 occasions and lost only 14 for the uh, 2014 season. Similarly, when we actually started to go over 10% of values for that uh, 75th percentile, teams lost on 62 occasions and won only 9. And again, if we come back and have a look at our, uh, at our graph here, you'll see that these values over 0.1, or 10% or in this case, certainly uh, are more associated with losing. And then finally, we also saw that teams actually having a 50th percentile values for goals actually won 39 out of 40 times during the season. And if, again, if you do some quick maths in your head, you'll, you'll realise that means that out of those 22 players, we're getting 11 contributors to goal scorers in those matches. And so certainly the results of the tree give us a little bit more granularity with each to understand who we want contributing to goals in a typical match. How did the model perform? Well, again, this type of analysis approach isn't going to look at that dependency between teams, unfortunately. But yet it starts to give us some really good insights and certainly improves by about 20% with the ability to classify uh, a win and a loss. So just the last uh, three or four minutes, what I just wanted to spend uh, some time on is, is another application of how this work can be used to benchmark player performance. It's something that we, uh, we do a lot of it within the club itself, not so much in research, but again, it's, it's part and parcel of working in professional sport. Decisions need to be made on contracts at a, at, on a yearly basis. So if we look at some of the main contributions for our playing list in 2014, uh, bearing in mind that now 11 of these 44 players are no longer on our roster, we see that certain characteristics of defenders uh, well, well above that expected 4.54% are actually uh, starting to show up. So defenders have more rebound 50s but considerably less goals. If we look at our forward plays, we see that they contribute, not surprisingly, in, in most team sports, the forwards contribute more goals. In, this player in particular uh, contributing up to 14%. More marks inside that forward 50 area, forward 50 metres away from our, our own uh, goal. But they, re they also re produce far less rebound 50s and clearances. And then finally with our midfielders, we start to get a bit of a more even distribution the way they contribute to certain team totals, um, rather than that, that, that kind of polarised... Um, performance metrics that we see in the defenders and the forwards. So some of the ways that we use benchmark, and this is a, a very popular in a lot of sports in Australia, uh, and as well I've seen it done uh, in this country and the UK as well, but just using a spider or a radar plot, we can start to benchmark at a, at a given point in time just about what this means. So in this particular example, we've actually reported these performance indicators. Uh, the blue line is our average or expected 4.5% for a player, and the orange in this particular case is our midfield average for that particular midfield group. So we see these types of things I showed you on the previous slide. Midfielders produce more clearances than what we'd expect from a, a typical player, more tackles, more disposals. And then we can benchmark this particular midfield player who's a, a quite a good player within the team as far as what they're doing well and what they're not doing so well. Certainly things that whether we decide to accentuate their, their skill sets already or whether we decide to, to focus on their weaknesses is something that we use, uh, with those types of decisions we make uh, in conjunction with the coaches. So if this particular player has a, a high uh, contribution to the team total of uncontested possessions but quite a low contribution to clearances. And what we started to do with this data uh, this year is actually start to look at actually expect and actually track this longitudinally for each player. And so, again, if we look at this example here, we've got uh, a player for each game that they performed during that actual season, for that 2014 season, and we can see that their disposal percentage contribution to the team is indicated by their blue dot here. So they had a really good game in this particular case with respect to disposals and quite variable towards the, uh, the end of the season. And the red line I actually haven't attached a legend for, but the, leg uh, the red line just refers to the midfield average that I showed you on the, the previous slide. 
And so we would see that towards the end of the season, these players, uh, even though they've been quite variable, they're starting to improve to a state where they're actually just nudging above the midfield average. So we'd be fairly happy with this player with respect to the disposal output um, for this particular season. Although we may want to work on their consistency of their output, particularly towards the end. So the limitations of some of the work and, and some of their future opportunities, just in closing. Obviously, there's a number of observational de dependencies when we're doing this type of work. Um, we've only controlled for team dependence within the GE model. Obviously, there's, there's a number of different types of dependencies we could also have looked at. We could experiment with different correlation structures. Uh, again, similar to Hannah's work, we potentially could have looked at a mixed effect model instead of a, a generalised estimating equation. And, and obviously, some of the main challenges that we find with this work is always making that interpretable by the, the coach. Uh, and, and from a visual perspective is, is in particular important. So future directions, I mentioned earlier, we started to combine this distribution data with the magnitude of differences as well with our, our data. Um, certainly preliminary analyses are quite positive in that sense. Um, we've also talked about extending this to other elements of the organisation. So on the right hand side are some of the things that our recruiting staff, our uh, I'm not sure what you call them here, our scouts, if you will, in the US, uh, look for in some of our players. So obviously some of these are a little bit more difficult to measure than some of the things I've talked about today. So resilience, uh, durability, these types of things that we rate as well. And so this start, starts to beg the question, how many players within our roster do we need to have resilience, leadership, versatility, positional craft? And so the, the, uh, this method certainly can be applied to these types of measurements in future as well. Thank you. Any questions? So just the one basic question. So what's your thought initially? Is it superstars or more even distribution? <laughs> I know it's kind of early still, but. Yeah, certainly, I mean, uh, you can, particularly with the goals type of work, you can see, and, and goals wins, wins matches, obviously, so it's a fairly important one. Uh, it, it does appear that, that certainly getting those midfield type players um, and to contribute to goals is becoming more important. There's some changes that are coming into the, the, the game next, um, next year, which actually will limit the amount of uh, rotations or interchanges that players can do. So again, players won't be able to come off the ground as much. So the need for a midfielder to actually go into the forward area and actually kick goals is going to become more pronounced. So I think you'll see an even uh, greater push towards some of the results we've found here already about players needing to be versatile and perform multiple functions within a team. Thank you. Uh, in your initial video, uh, I don't think the term rebounds was discovered. Could you explain what rebounds are? Sure. So you might have seen the, the, the 50 metre arcs at each end. So when the ball actually uh, is moved into the, uh, the opposition's end of the field, uh, it's a hallmark of a defender that can actually rebound that ball back out of that area without the other team scoring. So, uh, and then obviously at the other end, an inside 50 would be a player bringing the ball inside that area. Clearance and soccer. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Let's take a seat again.